Good afternoon. Today I've got some exciting news to share with you. Believe it or not, I found the solution to most of the problems our societies are playing with. Climate change, slow economic growth, back pain, you name the problem, I have the solution. Want to know what it is? Simple. We just need to all speak more about science. Now why science? We live in an increasingly technologically advanced society. And so improved background scientific knowledge could help us all negotiate it. Reduce risk to health and well-being, a, a better a moral decision-making, a more democratic society. These are all benefits to a more scientifically literate society. Now, how do we get there? A science communication is notoriously difficult. But today, I'd like to give you my perspective on this issue, building on my experiences with Subbox Science an initiative I co-founded in 2011 with Dr. Sarian Summer. So what's Subbox Science? It's basically science communication with a twist. Our aim is to surprise the unexpected passing audience by getting our speakers, who are all women scientists, to talk about their work in the middle of busy streets and shopping centers. What we're trying to achieve is to inspire the people that do not get generally exposed to science while promoting gender equality in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So far, we have helped to organize 15 free events in the UK, with another 14 coming up this year, including our first one in Australia. Each event includes 12 speakers, which means that at the end of this year, we will have promoted the work of more than 350 women. I've learned a lot of lessons about science communication and bridging the communication gap between scientists and the public. And today, I've got five lessons for you. One for each completed sub-box science round. I'm not old, but I'm old enough to remember and reminisce about the time when no one would talk about public outreach and science communication in universities. Some of my colleagues would see science communication as them writing an article about their work in the lab's newsletters. Now, thankfully, things have changed, and keen communicators are found more commonly in the scientific community, inspiring the next generation to follow on their footsteps. But why would a scientist want to talk to the public? I can tell you about the typical reasons that motivate our subbox science speakers. For some, it's about raising their visibility and securing more opportunity to talk about their work, with assessment of institution and scientists now being more prone to take into account metrics related to impact. It has become really important to demonstrate that what we do a scientist matters to all of us. And so public outreach provides a very tangible way to increase the, the profile of one research, or the, of the scientist, or the institution. But for some other speakers, it has nothing to do with recognition and visibility. It's all about them caring about the message and wanting to open a dialogue around the issue. For some of those speakers, and I would say they are the majority, it's about them wanting you to think differently about something that matters a lot to them. Now, that message that they care about might be related to their research, but it can also be related to who they are and what they want you to know about the community they belong to. And so my first lesson, based on all these examples and this, those stories I've heard is that if you are a scientist, there's at least one good reason uh, to communicate with the rest of society. Lesson number two, the public is everyone. Now that's something I've noticed. When we talk about public engagement, we tend to forget that the public is everyone. And that includes people who are not interested in science, who do not dream to talk to a scientist, who are not all reading a science magazine. 
And now that diversity in the level of interest in science really need to be appreciated from the onset for effective communication to happen. More efforts also need to be devoted to engage the people that tend to avoid anything sciencey. Now the problem is most of the current set of opportunity open up to scientists to engage the public about science tends to focus on preaching to the choir, that is, talking to people that already love science. And little is being done to bring those scientists to new and familiar and maybe more difficult audiences, even though the benefits that I mentioned in my introduction are best reaped when we engage those uninterested parties. Now, admittedly, to do so uh, may require a bit more work and it may be more demanding on the scientists. Actually, how we do this largely remains an open question. But at the moment, there's a real need to identify and engage the people that aren't being talked to. Lesson number three is about where. Now, you may be interested in science, but very few of us have actually the passion to sit in a TEDx event. Not everyone feels confidence to join a scientific cafe and start arguing over the latest scientific development. Not everyone thinks that a visit to the nearest scientific exhibition is a number one for a weekend of fun. And so my point is that science communication, public engagement, requires a portfolio of means to trigger his interest. And that include, among many other things, the consideration of a diversity of venues. Now, far too much focus for the moment has been put on trying to invite the people to meet the scientists and experience their familiar settings. And not enough focus has been put on inviting those scientists to meet people in their familiar settings. I think about the typical venue used by scientists for engaging the public about science all over the world. The world. This tends to be museums, labs in schools, universities, research institutions, or a prestigious building seen as the mecca of science. <coughs> but science communication doesn't need to be merely about the how and where science is being done. It can also be about why this particular issue is being considered. It can be about the different products that are generating the, during the different research phases. It can be about the places that are most likely to use the outcome of the research. And it can also be about the scientists and their personal journey. And so my point here is that Considering alternative narratives could actually open up opportunities to, to bring those scientists in new venues, such as art festivals, cruises, office spaces, community centers. But I really think that where is something that we haven't been exploring enough. Lesson number four is how also matters. Now we all have our favorite mode of expression. We all have our favorite way of being on it. Some people are very visual. It's all about color and shapes. Some people love storytelling. And for some people, it's about doing it, feeling that they are participating in what's going on right now. And the problem is, unsurprisingly, monologues with slides is unlikely to be seen as engaging by everyone. Yet this is the primary way of communicating in the science world. And therefore, it's the default setting in the scientist's mind as he or she starts to think about public engagement and science communication. Now, if we are as scientists to successfully reach a broader spectrum of the society, we're going to have to start appreciating and more, important, and more importantly, using those different methods for communication. 
to uh, my final point is that scientists are no no superheroes. Now, early on, scientists are taught to think about facts <laughs> and accuracy and generality. And so uh, scientific talk are generally used by scientists as the place where they grill each other, asking really mean questions. And so for many, science uh, and communication in the science world can be quite stressful and unfun and uncreative and unrisky. Exactly the opposite of what you may mean when you're doing public engagement. And so said differently, public outreach activity are asking participating scientists to use skills that are mostly outside the set of competencies that is being rewarded in their community. And then participating in a public outreach in science communication event is actually undervalued when it comes to talking about appointment or promotion in academia, for example, career progression is mainly driven by funding and publication records and not much else. So said differently, public outreach activity are demanding participating scientists to do something that may take a lot of work and may, and may bring very little reward. Now, if we are to get more and better communication between scientists and the public, we're going to have to fix those two issues of skill development and of reward system. Now part of the solution may be to make sure that all scientists have access to relevant training. But it may also be about us, and by us I mean the taxpayers who are funding a lot of the science, to make sure that we are very clear and communicate clearly to the science community how this community should value science outreach in comparison, to, for example, to doing research and making discovery. So these were my five lessons. But who are they for? Well, they are clearly for the scientists that want to give a public outreach a first go. But they are also for um, the parents and the teachers who are trying to inspire the kids and the teenagers to consider a career in, in uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. This lesson, they may also be for the event organizer, who are maybe trying to say, well, why not bringing a science theme to my event this year? It might be for the journalist, trying to cover the latest science story. It could be for the policy makers, trying to find ways to promote a more scientifically literate society. And it could be for the businesses that benefit so much from innovation. Ultimately, those five lessons, they're actually for all of us, as we all have a role and a part to play in bridging the communication gap that we are experiencing. Thank you. <laughs>